welcome. Awesome. Thank you for coming today to Game Speed 2016. <laughs> Thanks for being here for our conference, and thank you for coming to this panel. On this panel, we're going to be looking at how do you bring back old, cherished, individual products. Uh, properties, revitalizing IP. And I've got a fantastic panel here. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, I'll start. Uh, Nathan Stewart. I'm the director of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, work at Wizards of the Coast and had the pleasure of uh, doing a lot of the uh, uh, help and bringing the, uh, the current version of uh, Dungeons and Dragons kind of back to the limelight. And what's amazing about Dungeons and Dragons right now, it's arguably bigger than it ever was even in the 1980s. It's just everywhere you're seeing it being written about in major magazines, major newspapers again, on TV, I mean, strange things. <laughs> Will Kasoy, leaving the building, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs> Was this something I said? <laughs> and I'm Brian Fargo. I uh, founded a company called Interplay back in the day. In fact, I worked on a lot of the Dungeons & Dragons titles. We did uh, Baldur's Gate and uh, Icewind Dale and Planescape Torment, but I've been in the business a long time, primarily doing role-playing games. And then I founded a company called In Exile, and uh, we're mostly known for crowdfunding these days. We've had three very big successful crowdfunding campaigns around Wasteland, Torment, and Bard's Tale 4. And so basically I've been on the front lines of the war for 30 plus years. And what's, what's fascinating about what Brian has done is you can arguably say that the quality of the games they're bringing back are even better than the originals, which are cherished. I would um, definitely argue that. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, for us, Wasteland 2 is probably our number two most best-reviewed PC game we've had in game speed existence. Really? That's great. And I'm David Reed. I am the founder and CEO of a Seattle-based indie developer that is mostly me right now called Meta Arcade. And the first project we're doing is an adventures platform that will allow anybody who can write a story to create their own narrative-driven adventure RPG. And the first title we've licensed is a game called Tunnels and Trolls that was originally published in 1975. It was the second role-playing game ever published after Nathan's Dungeons & Dragons. In all fairness, I did not actually. I know. It's the, it's the one he's representing. Uh -huh. I'll give them the credit, though. Yeah. <laughs> and, and what's fascinating about Tunnels of Trolls is that it's gone through its own rebirth in the 2000s, and it's now been kickstarted as a digital edition that they call the deluxe edition. Mm -hmm. And there's one thing that's meshing everyone here together, and it's community and how important is that. But how do you tap into these old communities of people who may not have played the game for 20 years but are still <laughs> loving what that game once represented? Uh, you know, you go first, yeah. So I think that's an interesting question. I think the more interesting question that we face uh, every day with Dungeons and Dragons is how do you be true to that audience while still uh, appealing to an audience of today too. So uh, it's kind of a tightrope and I would say that the best thing that you can do on both core or you know both the core and kind of the expanded audience is to really really understand what people love about the IP or the property. Sometimes you get an idea that they love this or they love that, but you got to dig a little bit deeper uh, into the uh, into kind of the emotional connection uh, that people have with the brands. And if you find that, if you can really isolate what that thing is, uh, you can usually uh, get any of those core people back who used to love it because you're delivering it on a new front. And then hopefully you can give them like you know like they can bring in their kids or their family or friends into the thing and create kind of a, a new audience as well. Yeah, and I, I say for us, part of our challenge also is to, is when we look at, when I look at the old intellectual properties, is to make sure that it lines up with a genre that still makes sense or is not overly crowded. You know, for us, we've been fortunate. So if uh, my old, pro if, if, if they were a MOBA or a shooter, for example, I probably would have had a difficult time getting people's attention since that kind of market feels saturated. Whereas with uh, Bard's Tale or Torment or Wasteland, uh, for the kind of role-playing game that I make, people love that and they weren't getting it served up to them. So to me, it's a combination of, of the old passionate uh, franchise uh, players mixing in with the genre that makes sense. But how do you get people to get into that old style of game that they've maybe never been exposed to before? Well, when you, when you mean the original fans, yeah. of course, you know, they're, they're uh, I mean, they're exposed to the brand. And, and, you know, there's always this friction between the, 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 the people that played the original one. If it was up to them, they would have you come out with a sequel <laughs> exactly as if it come out 10 or 20 years ago. And that would make them extremely happy. But then you'd completely alienate the new audience. And I think that's the real challenge for all of us is to how do you, how do you mix the old play patterns with the new play patterns and give them something that resonates with, with an experience they sort of grew up with and played, which is why we look for the touch points, we look for the sensibilities, the characters and that sort of thing, but we also mix it with the modern uh, play style. So that's yeah. why I never get my six 
member party groups anymore. Well, you, well you'll have one for Bardstow 4. <laughs> you'll be happy about that. Yeah, and I, I would just build on that in, in the same vein that, you know, the, you know, the, the Kickstarter adjacent sites was a 2013 Kickstarter that the uh, original creators of the Tunnels and Trolls game got back together, got 1,600 backers that raised 125,000 bucks for a deluxe Tunnels and Trolls rule book, uh, you know, a more modernized set of rules for, for the old classic pen and paper game. But one of the things that, that we've realized in, in looking into the community and talking to them is, you know, number one, uh, Tunnels and Trolls was a pioneer in solo adventures, right? It wasn't just a game about group play, but it was about the ability that, you know, back in an era where uh, it was hard to get your six-person party together around a table every weekend, right? You had the ability to actually get some dice, buy a solo adventure rule book, uh, adventure book, and play it on your own. And that is something that, you know, still is true to the core of Tunnels and Trolls. People remember this as being, for people who played both D&D and TNT in that era, that's what they remember most about Tunnels and Trolls. And so for us, it, as we start engaging with the community, one of the things that we realize is like a lot of people had always had the aspiration to create their own adventure. Uh, that was a lot harder to do 40 years ago, where you had print and paper, you had cogs, you had inventory, you had shipping. Uh, this is a much easier thing for us to do today. And so as we thought about how to really get the community excited about this stuff, we will be piggybacking on the Kickstarter group that, that backed the game a couple years ago, but bringing them something they haven't gotten before, and that's the ability to create these adventures to run them on digital platforms. Um, one of the things I thought about when you were talking, Brian, is that, and kind of relates to Tunnels and Trolls too, is also when you have these franchises that are 20, 30, 42 years old now, you get this really nice kind of effect that uh, we lost a lot of people to role playing games back in the days because they got busy. Mm -hmm. They got busy with life, they got busy having kids, they got busy doing stuff. One of the biggest challenges to getting six people together at a table to play D&D &D now uh, you know, is time uh, and, and that, that doesn't go away. But what has happened is, is you've gotten people who are now more professional, who have kind of evolved their careers in their life, now they'll make time for their hobbies. And so they've gone through this thing where like, look, I gotta make money, I gotta make mortgage, I gotta take care of the kids, get them off to the thing. And now it's like, oh, I can invest in me a little bit. So also mm -hmm. just kind of coming back in that with the old fans, they've always had that love and they've always wanted to play it. And the other things have gotten in the way besides the, I just don't wanna play anymore. And, and, and do things like Fantasy Grounds and Roll20, which are ways to play virtually, play a role in also helping you reignite these communities? That's absolutely why we partner with guys like that. When I was working um, uh, on Madden and working uh, with the NFL a lot, uh, I found it interesting that DirecTV's whole model was dis, uh, disenfranchised uh, fans. People who got moved, not disenfranchised in terms of we don't like them more, but they're, they're moved. They're out of their home market where, where their group was. Same thing with D&D &D players, right? I have moved away from my gaming group and I still wanna play. And so technology has afforded them the ability to play you, probably with their same gaming group from 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And so when you're looking at tapping these communities, you know, for Brian and, and for David, crowdfunding has been really important. But crowdfunding's yeah. changed. Yeah, well, the, uh, I mean, w without the fans, you know, there would be no crowdfunding. And I think people that, I often get sort of this amazement that, that, that all these fans would step up. And, and, you know, for us, we've had, we've raised $8 million from crowdfunding for the games and they're, and they're shocked. But I always say like, there's probably some band that, because for people who aren't from the space, that you grew up with as a kid, if, you're, if they got back together and made an album, would you pay 20 bucks for it? And they go, yeah, I would. So well, that's who we're talking to, you know, is that same group. But, but beyond the crowdfunding, I mean, the, our fan involvement starts, I mean, like in the case of our, of our Kickstarter, we started the conversation even before we launched. You know, what, what, what should the rewards be? What are the tiers? What are the sensibilities? You know, reminding ourselves. I mean, one of the things you look for in development is you, like, you want a lot of candor in your office, people that tell you exactly what they think. Well, that's not always so easy as people's egos are fragile or maybe somebody spent four weeks on a piece of art and people don't really like it and they'll talk about it in the halls but they won't talk about it in the conference room. The fans have no problem doing that. They will tell you exactly what they think at all times. It can be brutal but it's very important. So they've been great for helping us shape our campaigns and give us feedback all along and kind of really remind us of what's important. But then even after you launch, they, they want you to succeed. 
the fans do. They want you to be there. So, so then you, you, you need to give them tools so that they can run with it, right? And so you talk about social media, which is what they, it's why we give them great uh, art that they can share. We give them Imgur files that they can share. We give them videos on YouTube. It's to turn them loose and giving all the kind of the tools of the viral nature of a crowdfunding campaign and let them run with it. Because unless you have that group behind you creating excitement, you're not going to get there. And their, their uh, excitement is contagious. And that, that ends up infecting the press, too. And you absolutely need good press coverage, too, if you're going to get a crowdfunding campaign. Yeah, and I'd, I'd argue as well that, uh, you know, kind of to Brian's point, I'm not sure crowdfunding, I'm not sure the funding is the most important part of it anymore, right? I mean, certainly if you need capital to get something done, that's a great way to do it. But the, the real value in what, you know, we haven't really decided if we're doing a Kickstarter or something like that. But, but I lean towards it because there is no real better way to get your community involved in the development of your product, right? And, and you know, if they do get involved and they do contribute feedback and ultimately contribute money, uh, they're vested in it. They, it uh, to Brian's point, they want to see you succeed even more than they do as a fan of a franchise that's been going for decades and decades. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's great to get sort of the, the PR and the marketing heat around it. It's great to get the capital, but I think as Brian started, at the end of the day, if you don't have a vibrant community around your game when you're doing something like this, you, you don't have a lot of potential for success. And I think going in a crowdfunding direction ends up being almost as much about that direct dialogue with the gamer and, and what it is that they want to see as you evolve the franchise as it is about getting coverage and getting financing. So how do you do this direct dialogue without it being top down? Well, I, I put one, one fine point also on what he said that I think for people just on the crowdfunding part is that there's a, uh, that, that people don't understand that we bring 98% of our traffic to our crowdfunding campaign. People think if you're on Kickstarter, Indiegogo, yeah. whatever the case may be, but you, know, you, you can have the front cover of Kickstarter, which I've had several times, and it does not move the needle. You know, it has to be that you're bringing the audience over to you. And so so, it's, not so like the app, it's not like the App Store then, where if you're a featured game, you're gonna no. get you know, 30 times more downloads. Yeah, not, not at all. I don't, I don't find that people are browsing Kickstarter for things to kick off or, or, or help fund. Whereas on the App Store, that, that would be the case that you are browsing the App Store and looking for what's new and hot. And, and the, you know, your commitment's a couple bucks or maybe free, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a different, different mentality. So I think that's a very important part. Again, you know, once again, the importance. You, know, you look at, uh, uh, what was it, uh, Exploding Kittens. Uh, which, you know, it seems random that they rate, what was it, $7 million? It's crazy, or yeah. Whatever. It, was, it was a lot of money for a game called Exploding Kittens, but he was tapping into the oatmeal audience, mm -hmm. and, and they love that. And so that was the thing. That's the, the secret sauce. You have to be tapping into some kind of audience. I mean, there's always an edge case for all of this stuff, but it's that, very important. That's so interesting because I've talked to some people I know, and we're, we must definitely be edge cases because we have actually gone to Kickstarter and browse and said, oh, this looks cool. Let's throw us five bucks here. And oh, that right. we love that. Let's throw 10 bucks over here. <laughs> yeah. There's some of that, but yeah. it's not the bulk of it. We need more people like you, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's not the bulk of it. Please, <laughs> Mark. Um, when we were talking about this, I was saying, you know, we don't really kickstart. Obviously, we're part of Hasbro, and it's not really um, the DNA. But I was, uh, in listening to you talk about it, we just approached it differently. We, we crowdsourced, we didn't kickstart, right? We did a two year long play test with 175,000 people that we let into the process early and gave them that feedback loop to do the same thing that Kickstarter does, right? Validate, we're mm -hmm. making the right choices, yep. point us in the right direction, have this meaningful, it wasn't like a beta. It's not like we said, hey, here's this thing 70% done. Yep. Tell us what we should fix and we'll finish it. Right. We said, hey, here's this nascent thing, help us shape it along yep. the way. And in the Kickstarter, you kind of get that same thing. We just, like to your point, we didn't need it for the funding, but we did need it for the uh, for the engagement. I think yeah. that's one of the things that made all the difference is that we included the fans early uh, and in meaningful uh, points along the way. So that's very interesting. D and D next as early access. Yeah, <laughs> two years early. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, back in the day, we would work on a game. You know, take Fallout for example. We would work on it in the dark and. <laughs> and, 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 you know, and we'd have our little QA department that, you know, was hopefully objective, but, you know, uh, not necessarily as, you know, you're not getting the, the, the wide swath of input. And, but we would just put it out there and keep our fingers crossed. And the idea of that today scares the hell out of me. I mean, I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine working on a game that I didn't have feedback first. Because oftentimes they, they will, something will resonate or something will not resonate in a big way that you think, gosh. So, so to me, I always look at working with the crowd, like you said, whether it's funding or not, is that I'm taking feedback that I used to get after I shipped and I get it before where I can do something about right. it. 
And, and this, to me, is, is just a fundamental pivot in how games are being developed these days. And, and it is exactly the sort of approach I'm trying now, where you know, I, I leave this panel and fly to Gen Con, where we're going to be providing our prototype there for people to demo for the first time. And uh, yeah, this isn't something we've been doing for months and months and months in the old kind of uh, ivory tower, as, as, or dark cave, I guess, as Brian suggests, <laughs> right? Where, where you don't really know what the player thinks until you kind of are finished and put it out there. This is more of a chance for, for me to be and showing it to people like, hey, does this feel like authentic tunnels and trolls to you in digital? Do you like the way the dice roll? Do you, you know, should we have black and white or color art? Is this the right adventure or should we pick a different one, right? And, and I think just, you know, this, this is an approach where you start rather than, you know, if you're launching Call of Duty, you're trying to burn down the internet and make sure tens of millions of people know the date that it's coming. This is more an approach of, I'm looking for a few dozen passionate Tunnels and Trolls people to be part of that early access adoption group who can inform us along the way and make sure we're steering the product in the right direction. They you don't can't, like to be called Tunnels and Troll people, that's derogatory. They don't like that? <laughs> well, that's my first mistake. Yeah, the, uh, you gotta listen to the crowd. There yeah, you go. Yeah, okay. but, but, it, but yeah, but part of, that, part of that as well, right? It is the, the idea that as you are having that discussion, you're getting it in front of people, you need to remember that at some level, uh, many of these franchises, right, they, they succeed with a core community that's been behind it for decades, but there's also a much bigger opportunity to go out beyond that, right? And so this is where if, if all you do is listen to the trolls, uh, you never really you know, are able to grow your game, right? And so it's important to think about what is it that keeps your core community happy, but also how do you grow that game to a new audience without disenfranchising that core yeah. community. So, yeah. so by involving the crowd, that's how you keep it from being a top down. Absolutely. And listen, I think the biggest lesson that we learned is to really listen, and not to what people say, but to all of it, like as much as what they don't say, um, seeing their actions, like we would do four different kind of real points of listening. Um, people doing surveys was one thing, but watching what people say on the boards, comparing it to what people say to your face, like you said with the art, right? Like the hallway conversation versus the boardroom. Yeah, right, like right. you gotta listen to them both. Oh yeah, that's really good, I really like it. Oh, they like it. No, that meant they hate it. <laughs> right, yeah. Like you gotta listen, and so, but you gotta hear things that they don't say, you gotta hear things that they do, you gotta listen to what they don't say. Like it's a really, it's a challenging thing, but if you stop and listen, they'll tell you what they want. Yeah, I, I, and, and the hardest part, and for all, for all of us, I think you guys agree, is that it's okay that we don't agree with them on every point, right? And you've got to sort of editorialize which ones I'm going to go with and which ones I'm not, because you can't literally listen to everything mm -hmm. you say. And, you, and, and the game's not going to be designed by committee, and you're going to have some strong opinions about the way things should be done. So it's, it's incorporating that. But that's where the magic happens, because you've got to know where you've got to pick your battles, because, like I said, it's okay to not agree with everything that you hear. So when, when you're trying to engage the crowd, you know, you definitely send stuff to them, but how do you use social media and how do you use getting out your message and encouraging others to get their message out of what you're doing? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it is part of the bread and butter of getting stuff done now, especially as you think about crowdsourcing, whether it's crowdfunding or just getting that input and that feedback and such. Uh, you know, people... Uh, whether they realize it or not, they're all content creators now, right? They're all posting on Facebook and Twitter and things like that, and it's, a, it's an excellent opportunity to get them to evangelize what you are doing without you having to go out and spend on a classic marketing campaign to do it and such. Um, there are different places where, you know, every game that has a history has a community. It may be hard to find, right? But they're, they're out there. They have their own Facebook pages. They have their own forums. They have places that they go and things. And you've got to go and navigate and find where they are, and you've got to communicate with them in their places, and you've got to give them that, that sort of ammunition so that they can amplify it for you. It's some, it's some of the stuff these guys have been talking about, about what are the things that, you know, you don't just give them a, a press sheet of key messages to recite for you. You give them assets, you give them images, you give them uh, early access that they can talk about, you let them share screenshots, you give them awards for their participation. Uh, it, it's, it's work, but it's certainly a better way to get people excited than just shout casting at them in advertising. It's better, than, it's better than your average ad dollar, but yeah. it's not the end, it's the beginning. Right. And I totally agree with everything you've said, but there was another point that uh, I think comes before on our side. We do that, plus uh, a woman at uh, Starbucks at a panel just like this uh, said this phrase that I always remember now. She said, it's Alex Wheeler, and runs their digital before they got to like a bajillion followers and everything. She said, don't outsource your voice. And not only did I take that to heart, but actually did the opposite. And we, we, we amplified our voice internally, and we found the right people to be the talkers out there who were super passionate, who were super sincere, and just really, you know, really wanted to have that meaningful relationship with the thing. So that's why, like, Jeremy Crawford or Mike Merrills or Chris Perkins, like, I don't 
tell them, oh, this is what to go say to the community. We just empower them the same way you empower the, mm -hmm. the communities to talk like they normally would. And because they love it so much and because they uh, care so deeply about the, uh, the brand or the hobby or whatnot, uh, that really shines through. And part of it is because, again, you didn't outsource your voice, so you know they're passionate. And number two is these people are natural leaders, which is why they're creating to begin with. So, so in, in a way, also, isn't this how you ended up with more D&D-themed live streams and shows that there are, you know, sitcoms on network TV now? I mean, just empowering the audience. It's like David said, like, they're out there, and when you go find them and you say, hey, can Chris Perkins dungeon master your, your live game? Oh, I mean, that right there just gets you a yes. Like, you just said the word Chris Perkins, and it was in, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, we were just talking about the guys over at Beamdog, and it's like, hey, do you want to play D&D with the original Minsk and Boo? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. like, you just find these people, and you throw just a little bit of a kernel. When you've got this long-loved IP, the power of being able to bring like just little behind the scenes things, little things that you've built up, like the power of the ampersand, like having a yeah. piece of merch with the ampersand or a dice like this. This is like the best tchotchke on the planet, right? Like it doesn't cost that much, but you, you hand this to a fan at Gen Con and you know, you just basically gave them carte blanche to talk for hours about how much they love the thing. Because all you were doing was actually unlocking and empowering their love that's already built up for this franchise over time. They just needed like that kind of that, uh, that kernel of, of, of a spark. And I, and I would add that, that it's also important on how you treat them on a day in day out basis, not just when you're launching a campaign or anything else. So like you said, handing them the dice, you know, or, or your business practices that don't take advantage of them. You know horse armor for a dollar is going to make them upset, right? And so what are you going to do? So you have to think about the, 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 uh, your profits over the goodwill you're associating with your fan base because they're going to be there for you to help promote your product or fund you or get the awareness out or give you feedback. So the care and feeding of them is very important. Ten so, years later, and Todd's still paying for that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Unfortunately, so, it's the it's the go-to place. No, for no, that. it's fantastic. Yeah. I just, yeah. it's <laughs> so how do you do this without treading on people's cherished memories? Well, I was going to say that, that's the trickiest part of all this is that, is that I find all the time that we are not competing with reality, but we're competing with their memory of the game at the time that they played it. You know, I have people that tell me with played Fallout that, oh, you know, they're, they, you know, they're, you know, goo goo eyed because they learned how to speak English from the game. You know, or people that tell me, I, I used to play, this one makes me upset though, they used to tell me, I used to play with my grandfather, you know, I don't like to hear that, you know, but uh, yeah, so they talk about growing up as a child, or, or be, when they were in the dorm rooms with no responsibilities and no bills and all fun and beer and pizza parties, playing those original games, I'll never be able to replicate that, but in their mind, they associate that goodwill just playing the product and there was more going around outside of that. So that's the trickiest part with what we do when we, when we kind of work on these old franchises. Mm -hmm. But I think the other thing too is don't compete with their memory. Right, right, right. right. Create something new. Yes. Like cherish their memory for what it was, right? Just like it was a memory for you because it was close to you as well. Mm -hmm. And use that as the inspiration for the new thing. But they want to reward you for making something new. They don't want to just do the old thing. And so you're not actually giving them what they asked for. You're giving them like the... Right the inspired next evolution of so, it. Wouldn't one good example of that be with um, Dungeons and Dragons, the new giant storyline? You're not redoing the old Avengers yeah. against the giants, you're doing something completely new. Well, and that's our whole model, right? If you go on the forums and you read, they, they'll tell me what my next five stories are in Dungeons and Dragons, because they're just going back to their top 10 favorite stories ever, and, and our model's not a secret. We take these, these themes and these models and these stories that have resonated for years, and then we say, how do we use that to spark a whole new one that's very true to the theme and the core elements, but it's a new story, right? On Giants, this one's completely different, but it has all the elements that made against the Giants or uh, um, you know, the different G modules back then. Like, they're perfect, right? Uh, same thing if you're doing like the S modules and stuff. Like, if you're gonna do a Tomb of Horrors today, now, you know, I already know what happens when I stick my hand in the Tomb of Annihilation, right? Like, it does me no good to make that adventure again. So you have to get to the essence of what that was about, right? Like, yep. it is the deadliest dungeon thing. They took it to Gen Con to basically be a challenge to say, you think you're good at D&D? &D? Mm. Here, this one will kill you. So, you know, if we ever get to making the new Tomb of Horrors, guess what? We're going to try and kill people with yeah. it, right? It's the same thing. Well, and, and, you know, a lot of, I think, as I've gone through my own experience now with, with bringing Tunnels and Trolls digitally is probably similar to... Uh, as, when I think about Tomb of Horrors and, and, and other seminal adventures from, from great historic IP, you know, 
in our minds, it's kind of this idea, right? Uh, like, well, the first one we're doing for Tunnels and Trolls is Naked Doom, which was uh, an adventure where you're a criminal and more often than not get killed in the first room by two archers with poison arrows, right? And it's a pretty brutal adventure. And because it, you died so often in that adventure, it just felt like this massive, massive thing that you never got to the end of. But once you start boiling it down, it's like, well, it's 100 paragraphs of text. There's 10 major things that happen in there. Um, when you start taking out all the arcana of, of what was a pen and paper game, of, of you had to roll the dice, you had to do the math in your head, you had to turn a bunch of pages and things like that, and you put that stuff digitally, it's just super, super fast, right? And, and this is where you, you start to realize, okay, look, if you, if you simply take that experience, bring it out digitally, then you are competing with memories and you're going to lose, right? You know, that you've got to do something slightly different. You've got to bring a new take, a new remastering a new expansion to the idea or else yeah you know this adventure that for 40 years in my head had been you know it was like you know the fellowship of the ring and in the end it's like well no it's like the first five minutes of it and you're done right so you know that is part of the balance of don't compete with the memory you know keep a certain amount of that together with integrity and authenticity but you've got to find a way to expand it if you want to really do something interesting digitally well in my head bard's tale animations and graphics were amazing right they <laughs> don't, were don't, don't look back no, yeah no, no. <laughs> no. We, 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 when we did the uh we we did a kind of a bard's tale comedy if you remember in 2004 just as a as a lark i, I I wanted to mock other role-playing games because that's where my mind was at at the time. And uh, but anyway, but people said, "Oh God, that was so great! There was so much great comedy in the first one." And I thought, "No, nah, there was no comedy whatsoever in the yeah. first game." But in their mind, it, there was there was comedy that, that we had brought back. So that sort of thought was a good example of that. My my brother still 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 says, "Oh, if you ever talk to him, make sure he doesn't do a comedy game again." <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> lesson learned. Yeah. Well, I don't know. It sold a lot. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I learned a lesson. But we're so, not doing a comedy anyway. Um, I would like to take a couple of questions. Uh, we're running here really short on time. Does anyone have a question they would like to ask? So what I would tell you is answer the questions backwards uh, from how you're asking them. Uh, so the first thing you're talking about is sizing up the existing audience, right? So let's pretend the Dungeons and Dragons, uh, the role playing game, just the tabletop role playing game, not Baldur's Gate, not our movie, not books, or just the tabletop role playing game. That industry is fairly finite, right? You can kind of figure out how much it is. So let's pretend we had 100% of the market share in that, which, I mean, that'd be crazy, but, you know, okay, so let's say 50%, right? Like, you know what that audience is, and you know what that, um, uh, what that opportunity is, right? And so if you're, like, looking at this thing, you're like, oh, we're going to make, you know, 10 times more than, no, you're not. You know what I mean? So you've got to be realistic about what that audience is. So then that's going to lead you to the next question, which is, okay, what's our appetite for growth, uh, and what are the, the natural audiences that we go to after that? So in Dungeons & Dragons, I think the, the more interesting thing was, we saw this crown swell, like when you see the renaissance of board games coming and, and fantasy being what it is, you know, it's kind of like using a, a sociologist uh, point of view and kind of looking at the world themes combined with the player feedback and what people were saying. And it just was really clear that, um, that if, we, if we did the right thing, the, the audience wanted that now, they, that there is a new audience for it. And so then that gives you the opportunity, right? Okay, here's your new audience. You've got you know, X many, you know, 20 to 25 year olds who have never played a Dungeons and Dragons game. Oh, except they have, right? Because Dungeons and Dragons, and Gary Gygax and Arneson put that out, right? They fueled a whole industry. And so leveling up, experience points, what's your decks, all these things that are so very D&D &D or, or generic fantasy anymore, you know, they, they do love them, they have played them, but they've never experienced the storytelling and the, and the mythos of Dungeons and Dragons. So I think what we've done is we've said, okay, let's take all those things that were trend-setting and cool back in the day and, and bring those forward. Let's create some new innovative stuff that's kind of pushing the, the, the design forward, and then let's take the best elements of the IP 
and and wrap that story thing around it because that's how people want to um, want to engage with their entertainment now. But if we had to like, hey, take it out of the cold locker shelf, I don't know. That would be horrible, right? Like we'd never stopped taking care of D and D. I mean, we've been putting out products for 42 years, uh, so it's just how much energy and um, and uh, and resources you put behind. Like when do you kind of double or triple down on it? And what I tell you is. Building a new IP is really expensive. Uh, you know, revitalizing uh, an IP that has a big fan base and has the power to reach millions of people is a, a much better bet if you can do it. I mean, I think it's why so many people license, right? So for us, it wasn't the question of, hey, is it the right time? Uh, it was more the, it's the right time. And you guys need to do the right thing for the brand. And so what we did was we invested for a few years uh, in it, uh, you know, thanks to Hasbro and Magic, we had that opportunity, but we basically said, hey, we haven't done a really good, you know, kind of refresh on, on this in a long time. It's got perennial potential. It's, you know, it's a very well-known, beloved brand. And, um, you know, you got two choices, or I guess three, right? You can build something new, you can double down on this, or you can get out of the business. And, you know, and we decided that, uh, you know, well, we had some really good ideas in D&D. What? No, sorry, I'm just uh, commenting that I have to get going to the airport. Pretty oh, soon. yeah, <laughs> sorry, so, and then I'm long with that, it. That, that's Nathan, that's all right. No, that, I, well, I'll give you a quick thing to think about, right, which is that, you know, kind of to your point about the, the size of the audience, right, I think at some level, a lot of these classic IPs, right, the, the size of the audience, is, it, you know, they haven't been in the market like Dungeons and Dragons has consistently for 40 some years. And, and what I'd, say, at least in my view, on looking at Tunnels and Trolls and other ones, is that it, it tends to be a, a little bit about the existing audience, because you want to start with them and you want to make sure you're, you're representing the brand with integrity and authenticity, but do you believe this is an IP that can resonate with new gamers, right? And in the case of TNT, I, I do think so. Uh, and it comes back, some of what you're getting at is, is what I'd call the, the totality of, of what it is you're trying to do on the business, right? Uh, we are not trying to, you know, compete with the kinds of games these guys are making uh, with, with heavy graphics and, and real-time action and things like that. Um, that would probably be a bad idea because these guys and others like them are doing a great job of it. If you're going to do something interesting with uh, an IP that maybe isn't, you know, in the public eye right now, you're, I think you're better off trying something different. And in our case, it's something that is a, a much lower cost. It's something that can be crowdsourced a lot more. And it's something that I think will resonate with people who never, ever heard of Tom and trolls. But you do build on the legacy of that rich IP and you take it from that direction as opposed to, like Nathan said, if uh, I think if what I was doing was starting from scratch without an IP, I don't think it would be nearly as interesting as being able to say we've got this 40-year-old IP that was the second RPG ever made and the first place ever to have solo adventures. And inspired Fallout. And inspired Fallout. Well, and the other theme between the three of us is that... I'm trying to give you uh, some extra. Well, yeah. thank you. I'm, I'm going to use that, Brian. Consumers are, <laughs> are super savvy now and they really like to go deep and what all three of us do right as we have these platforms that are great shallow experiences but they have a lot of depth behind them too if you want to go there so i think that that's one of the things in terms of just seeing what the audience wants now we're, we're more set up for success in this era of fans and audiences uh than maybe in the yeah. 80s or 90s when twitch gaming was a thing anything you want to add brian well, they hit a lot with that. I mean, I, I guess, uh, I'm trying to remember all the, all the questions that you had on that, I think it's in terms of, uh, you know, managing the two different, you know, the, the new user versus the old user, we put a lot of thought into that. Um, one of the most common questions we get is, will people who didn't play the first game be able to play it? Which, of course, right? I, I almost look at it the way like Pixar movies as humor that operates for a kid and for an adult. And, and so in the same way, we try to create an experience that in total holds on its own um, you don't have to know anything about the first one, but if you did play the first game, it's just chock full of stuff that you will truly appreciate having played the first one. And we, we pay off gags from Wasteland 1 20 years later, right? And so if you played that first game, you're going to think it's the funniest thing on the planet. You know, for anybody else, you're not going to quite, quite get how clever that was. Mm -hmm. so, so we love doing that stuff, and that would be an example of it. So we're, we're, we, always, we never require it, but we, we, we always pay it off for the original people yeah, that's a great who, way to who put played it. it. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for coming. Right. <laughs> I, 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 I,